Thank you very much, Mike. I'm going to bottle that up and save it for the hard days because that was really a lovely reflection um, on my career. So uh, I also want to just thank Rona Jack for suggesting this topic and me as a speaker. Um, I'm really excited to get to talk with you all today. Um, and it's always fun to get an opportunity to put together a new talk um, and maybe have some new nuggets for people I get to work with every day so they won't get bored. So I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, I am supported by work through, the, um, through Evicor and other um, things, but all of that is um, separate from my work at Seattle Children's. So today, through the talk, we're going to talk about um, the role of genetic counselors in laboratory test stewardship, specifically in genetic test stewardship. Uh, we will go into some detail about coding and reimbursement for genetic tests, um, as well as the insurance authorization process. I'll try and keep it engaging. Um, it is work that I find very interesting, but I recognize that not everyone feels the same way. So let's get started. Uh, what is laboratory stewardship and why should we care about it? So definitions are important. Uh, many of you may be familiar with previous terminology, utilization management, and we've shifted to this new term which has a more positive sort of spin to it um, and is really referring to responsible use of um, limited healthcare dollars, uh, ensuring that we're only doing testing that is really appropriate for patients. And put simply, it's this value equation. So we can increase the value of testing if we're having a careful consideration of the quality of the test divided by cost. And so it aligns with uh, antimicrobial stewardship, and we're in good company with them, and the philosophy is really the same. And I think by piggybacking on that, we can turn utilization management into a more um, positive view and get people on board with this movement. So stewardship involves improving these, the following um, four areas. So misordering tests, uh, misinterpreting test results, failure to retrieve and act on test results, and these top three are the top three lab, um, reasons for lab-related litigation in the US, so it's pretty important to all of us. And then ultimately, all of these can have an important impact on cost to both patients, us as patients, and to the healthcare system as a whole. So it's important for us to focus on improving them. In the space of genetic testing, um, which is growing um, exponentially, stewardship is even more important. So people always talk about the explosion of genetic tests, but um, they really are growing at a rapid rate. And so this is information from Concert Genetics, who um, is a uh, provider of, um, it's a tool where you can um, catalog different um, genetic testing options. And their um, data shows that 14 new genetic tests enter the market every day. These aren't novel new tests, but you know, a variation on a test that was already in the market. Um, but basically adds to the complexity of the work that genetic counselors in our role have to do or providers trying to select tests. And you can see um, the graph here on the right-hand side shows the distribution of tests. Um, and so there's been a, a good amount of work in pediatric and rare disease, but also distribution across other testing domains. So in addition to the increase in availability of genetic tests, uh, it's pretty exciting in terms of the accessibility of genetic tests. I'm sure that all of you get notifications, or maybe it's just my phone because it listens to me all the time, but about 23andMe, um, Thanksgiving is a great time to have all your genetic testing um, performed. Um, <laughs> it's easy to do, you just spit in this cup, or even now you just swab your cheek and you can do your dog, your um, child, whomever. So that's all really exciting, but again, sort of muddies the water between what is really clinically useful testing. Um, there's been an increase in the complexity of testing, um, cost, and coding. And people would argue with me on cost potentially because the cost of sequencing has actually really gone down dramatically over the past several years. But due to coding challenges and lack of clarity about how to use codes, the cost to the insurance payer and then ultimately to us as patients has gone through the roof. So really an opportunity for us to, for us to consider that and consider interventions to improve it. Um, we see an increase in orders, especially from non-genetics experts, and I believe, I, I really feel the technology is significantly outpacing our practical understanding of what we actually do with the results. So it's interesting, I found a variant in that gene, it fits the phenotype for my patient, but what does it actually mean for them long term? And I think we're doing kind of catch up to really find those answers. And then the definition of test quality really does vary depending on who you're talking to. Um, and is an important consideration um, in our work um, doing test stewardship. What is the provider's perspective, the patient, the payer, and us as the laboratory? 
So that's the backdrop for talking about who are genetic counselors and why do we have an important role to play in laboratory test stewardship. And so many of you may be familiar with this article uh, published by Chris Miller and her colleagues. She's a genetic counselor at ARUP Laboratories. And this was really the first paper that um, clearly documented the impact genetic counselors can have on identifying order errors, errors and improving them, and then the associated cost savings that can be realized um, when genetic counselors are involved. And um, really, you know, genetic counselors have been doing this a long time, but I'm grateful for them um, for publishing this paper. And really, the timing of it resulted in um, a nice combination of, uh, of an opportunity for me to join the lab at Seattle Children's um, and start the stewardship program. So who are genetic counselors? Um, we have our own Genetic Counseling Awareness Day, so that's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming up on November 4th, so give a high five to your genetic counselor colleagues. Um, but it's a master's level training program focused on both medical genetics um, as well as genetic counseling training. Uh, the term actually was first coined in 1940, which I didn't know. Um, and the first graduating class of genetic counselors was out of Sarah Lawrence College in 1971. Um, and now there's over 5,000 genetic counselors in the United States and 7,000 globally. Um, but even with that many, there is um, a workforce shortage relative to the amount of genetic testing and counseling needs. Um, and we're not expected to reach an equilibrium for some time. So based on the core skills of genetic counselors, I would argue that we're a pretty good fit for um, laboratory stewardship, even a great fit. Um, our skills include being well-versed in clinical phenotypes and available testing options, um, tend to be information seekers and really wanting to understand what's going on with the family and consider the family broadly in terms of a diagnostic workup and testing algorithms. Um, our training makes us knowledgeable about nuances between testing methods um, and understanding the broader healthcare system so that we can navigate that appropriately. We tend to be pretty good team players and problem solving, very type A. Um, and then lastly, skilled in communication, which I think is pretty important for this work. Um, my mom often says, you're doing that counseling thing to me again, aren't you? Um, and it, but you know, in this work, I think it is important to figure out how we present information um, so that we're respectful of the orders that are coming in and the, the situation so that we can achieve the best outcome for patients. So ultimately, what we're trying to do, the goals of genetic test stewardship are many, um, which is to stop errors, to avoid duplicate testing, to ensure that we're being, um, ordering high quality tests and are being fiscally responsible. Ideally, we're able to implement best practice algorithms, and then that translates to standard care um, models across an institution. We, our core skills really are in education, so we're motivated to make sure providers understand the why of why we're doing this um, and, and be engaged in that process so that they too can spread the, the message of stewardship. And then ultimately that should help us align with payers. Um, and really the focus should all be around the patient and patient-centered care. Okay, so how do we actually do the work? So I'm going to go through a little bit of background about tools for laboratory um, stewardship, and then some examples from our experience at Seattle Children's and a couple of other institutions. So I'm sure you're familiar with, or many of you are familiar with um, this paper um, by Dr. Baird that outlines different uh, stewardship interventions and their um, relative strength at actually having an impact on test orders. So an example of a gentle intervention, which is usually pretty easy to implement, would be a, um, a flyer, an educational flyer, that tells you the differences between different tests and why you might select one test over another. And my colleagues in the audience can attest to the fact that those are great to provide, but people can't find them when they need them, and they don't always have the impact that we intend. Um, and then there's a number of different interventions here, but um, some stronger ones would be privileging. So ensuring that only um, expert providers in a specific area really are allowed to order tests, and they're hidden for other providers or requiring high-level um, review of orders by an expert like a genetic counselor or a pathologist. And so this case example highlights um, having, how that case review by a genetic counselor can be impactful. And so I hopefully it will give you kind of a, a feel for um, what the work is that we do day to day. So in this case, it's a five-year-old female with lower extremity arthrogryposis, probably a loader, lower motor neuron etiology. And the neurologist involved requested preauthorization for a TRPV4 del deletion duplication analysis. And as part of our process, we're involved in review at preauth, and 
when we reviewed it, it seemed a little bit unusual, and um, the assessment was that the majority of variants are actually sequence variants, and so the appropriate testing strategy would be starting with sequencing of that gene, and then we can always reflex to deletion duplication later. So that's what we got pre off for, that's what was ordered. The results identified a pathogenic variant in this gene by sequencing, confirming the diagnosis of charcot marie tooth disease. Um, and fortunately, we, we obtained the diagnosis. If it had gone on the path it was going, we would have potentially missed that diagnosis. Um, and then the nice win is that we were able to have cost savings by doing the testing in a reflexive manner. So um, inspired by Chris Miller and wanting to um, address patient complaints related to bills received that were a surprise for genetic tests they didn't know had been ordered, um, we implemented our stewardship program. Um, it's gone through many evolutions over time, but currently we follow this two-phase review process. And so all genetic tests were reviewed at the time of pre-authorization. So, and I'll walk you through the details of what that looks like, but essentially we're assessing requests to make sure that they are appropriate, that it is actually the correct test. And then once we've established that, really trying to optimize the test. Have we found the best um, platform to answer the question that you're trying to address? Have we um, done it in a cost-effective way? Um, and how can we really find that best option? And we're doing all that before insurance authorization is even obtained. And then we do look again once the test is actually ordered to make sure that all of the details are correct, that the authorization hasn't expired, that we've got all of the details in place to make sure that we're um, ensuring high-quality tests when it's ordered. And all that information is captured in a, um, a database that allows us to um, track orders, have consistency across our teammates, and then um, capture metrics um, and give you the information I'm going to show you next. So at the time of pre-auth, the majority of requests are approved without any modification, but um, a percentage are, are canceled with, um, after conversation with the ordering provider, and then um, about 20% are modified. And the reasons for cancellation, I think, are important to point out. So we catch duplicate orders. Um, new information may come along. You know, they, they submit a pre-auth request, and they're also doing biochemical screening. And that information may lead them in a different direction. Um, and we're able to prevent additional work downstream by um, stopping the request at the pre-auth phase. And then at mod the modifications are largely related to improving the documentation or the test rationale. Um, so that it's clear in the provider's note when it goes to the insurance plan, why do you want this test, how is it going to impact management, and really kind of ticking the bullets from the payer's perspective of how we can get that test um, authorized. So our goal is really to ensure that's a smooth process, and by having these conversations up front, we can prevent medical necessity letters needed later, that sort of thing. And all of this is associated with pretty significant cost avoidance. Uh, and it's, we, we continue to see you know, impact even at the time of order. So you would think, well, if we did it at pre-auth, why are we looking again? But um, we have similar modification rates. Um, but at the time of order, we're catching when uh, insurance authorization hasn't been obtained. Um, I also want to point out there are times when the wrong test was ordered, and it's either we either choose to cancel that or modify it to the correct test. So that intervention, again, is helping with um, improving the patient safety and the diagnostic testing process for that patient. And again, associated with significant cost avoidance, which at our institution, about half of our patients are covered by Medicaid. So much of that money would go back to the, the laboratory and support the ongoing care for our patients. But the other half are really back to patients. So ensuring that co-pays and deductibles and things aren't being paid for things that aren't appropriate. So the other information that I think is important related to patient safety is capturing um, information around diagnostic errors. So this was a publication um, that we uh, put together. Actually, Dr. Matthias um, did a lot of this work, um, and Dr. Connick, who's in the room as well. We did a bunch of case review to try and identify by um, specialty and by setting what types of orders we, would um, we could see. And the highest order error rate is from genetics in the inpatient setting, which might seem like a surprise to those in the audience. Um, but it's because the genetics providers don't put in their own orders. So this is residents who are translating complex information from a, an expert and trying to get the order in correctly. And then the lowest order rate would be the genetics providers in the outpatient setting, but it's still not zero. So our whole process is looking at all providers, all orders, to just make sure that we can catch any errors um, if they are there. So uh, 
I told you I was going to talk about a couple of other um, processes. So this is a study that was published by a colleague, um, Jackie Riley, who's a genetic counselor at Cleveland Clinic. And they um, have a couple of different interventions that they employed. One, um, a clinical decision support tool. So we talked about privileging before. So this is set up so that for orders in the outpatient setting, this is on the graph here in A in this pie chart, they designate certain providers as deemed users, so experts in a specific specialty who are allowed to order specific types of tests, and then everybody else gets um, a bump back to say you can't order that test. And when that, that fires in the system, about half of the time the tests are canceled and there's no intervention needed from a genetic counselor or pathologist. In the inpatient setting, they have a strict restriction that only um, geneticists can order genetic testing or a consult has to happen. And so if you're a non-geneticist and you order it, you get a, a pop-up that says, do you want to have a refer to genetics? And they can do it. And about a quarter of the time they do, and the rest of the time the test doesn't proceed. So um, that you know, is impactful and easy, easy to implement in terms of manpower, maybe more difficult from an IT perspective. And then Jackie also was able to capture the impact of her case review as a genetic counselor. And so the graph here, um, A, shows the um, percentage of, or the distribution of modifications when she was involved. So over half were canceled after conversation with the provider, and then the rest would be modified or, or changed in some way based on her direction with um, significant cost avoidance. So this next study is from um, Dr. Suarez, who did his training here at UW and is now the director of the lab stewardship program at Stanford. And they uh, implemented both a proactive and a reactive approach to their um, lab stewardship program. And so they review test orders like we do when they're received, but they also have a formal consultation service. So if a provider is wondering what test to order wants to discuss it, they can reach out. So in this paper, they categorized their misorders into five different groups. Um, so clerical errors, uh, redundant testing, tests where they would suggest an alternative approach, controversial orders, and then things that they just had uncategorized. Controversial orders are interesting. So they categorized those as things that were not necessarily wrong, but there was not enough clinical utility evidence for the use of that test in that particular patient population which is a hard thing to argue with someone. Um, I think for sure in pediatrics, it's, you know, we're looking for those rare conditions. And so, um, and you don't have anything to back you up to say why it's not a good test to do. And so when they looked at the data, they showed that over um, this year period of these interventions being in place, that the combined effort was able to curtail the misorders of all types. But the biggest um, decrease was in those controversial orders. So even though they couldn't prove why it didn't really make sense, the fact that they could partner with their colleagues and talk about it really did have um, a positive impact on provider behavior. So genetic counselors also have a role to play um, from the uh, payer perspective. So um, having genetic counseling um, as a requirement was first done in 2013 by Cigna. So for a subset of their tests, they require independent genetic counseling um, by a board-certified genetic counselor not employed by the lab. They wanted to re remove any bias that a lab genetic counselor could have to try and encourage testing towards their lab, um, which is, I think, positive but also controversial in some ways. Um, and then uh, there's other genetic counselors that are involved in the actual case review or lab stewardship review at the health plan. And so this um, information was just published by a company, Informed DNA, um, who have genetic counselors, they call them genetic analysts, that are reviewing orders for appropriateness and helping to facilitate authorization for appropriate tests. And of interest is just their modification rate is very similar to what you'll see across other studies. Um, and then I guess, you know, the impact of preventing um, orders that are really not needed. So shifting gears from that real case review, I just wanted to highlight another intervention that's a great example of partnership between Seattle Children's Hospital and the University of Washington. Um, preventing duplicates you would think would be easy. You know, many, you don't need to do this test more than once in a lifetime, many times, but we all are very fluid in our healthcare. And so being able to capture those duplicates across health systems can be challenging. So the problem we were facing was duplicate orders on neonates that were delivered here and transferred to Seattle Children's, uh, and so what we in instituted was, you know, it's not simple, but there's a lot of communication around 
plans for um, patients who were seen prenatally and a testing pan plan was um, made. And then we can track when the, when the baby is delivered. We have a lot of communication with the genetic counselor, Whitney, here in the lab. And then um, through that communication, over about an eight-month period, we were able to prevent 11 tests. It doesn't seem like a lot, but we were pretty, great, um, pretty grateful to have caught those. Uh, because basically, you know, the test started here, UW was going to bill for it, and then we do a duplicate. We're not going to get reimbursed for that test. Also, um, the, you know, confusion around where those results lie and, um, and making sure they get into the right hands is really important to address. And so this process has really helped to um, improve the care for those kids, and we've gotten great positive um, feedback from our, our um, neonatal um, intensive care doctors as well. Okay, so hopefully you won't fall asleep through this part. This is the part I get excited about, but we're gonna talk about test coding um, and coverage, um, which is an important backdrop um, for some of the interventions that we have in place to try and align um, our stewardship interventions with improved reimbursement for these tests. So this is a similar diagram that we looked at before in terms of the new tests that are available on the market. Again, information pulled by Concert Genetics. And essentially what they're showing here is the products that are available, the tests, and then on the um, right-hand side, the commercial spend. It's probably not surprising that the majority of the spend from payers is in prenatal hereditary cancer and oncology um, treatment, um, but gives us a perspective for where we might have impact um, on, on payers and supporting care for, at least from our, our pediatric population, for some of that rare disease. Coding presents a fun challenge. So uh, there, this diagram shows the different combinations of CPT codes available for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer um, over a period of 18 months. The um, gray line shows the unique coding combinations. So these, these panels typically would at least have two genes involved, and you might use two codes, you might use many codes. And so they captured this and all of the chaos that would go along with that, which basically then um, results in potentially exorbitant bills. So we've heard of you know, a $40,000 claim sent to an insurance payer um, because coding was not clear. Um, the good news is that now there is a GSP code, which is a genomic sequencing procedure code um, specific to hereditary breast and ovarian cancer panels. So in theory, you would take away all that variability and have a single unique code, but um, that still is fraught with challenges for how people will use it or abuse it. Same would be true for expanded carrier screening. So again, the gray line is the unique coding combinations, and the blue line is the, com the um, cumulative com uh, effect of that, um, those coding fund. And you know these are much bigger panels. So you would expect them to be higher. Fortunately, again, this one has a GSP code now as well that can be used, a single code to, in theory, capture that. And the benefit of this for labs is that it's a unique identifier for your test. They can apply an insurance coverage policy to that and make sure that we're using this test appropriately um, and, and you know, set hopefully more fair reimbursement related to that um, and get rid of some of the fraud, waste, and abuse in the system of people who might be trying to game the system and use multiple codes. Um, the challenge is there's only 33 of these codes to describe multi-gene panels. <laughs> Each year I get excited, like maybe there will be a new code, and there's not ever really a new code. So it's not evolving at the rate we need to, but it's helping in some of the biggest areas based on the spend. I, I did want to touch on PLA codes, which um, many of you may fam be familiar with or not. Um, it stands for Proprietary Laboratory Analysis, and these are codes that are requested by the clinical laboratory or the manufacturer that's offering that test. Um, it's a much easier process to get a PLA code in terms of working with the um, American Medical Association. And um, the idea of it is it, you know, it gives you that, that clarity or a distinct mark for your test. Um, I do think if one lens would be it puts a bullseye on something, it's easier for a payer to say, I'm not going to cover that which may be very fair. Um, there often may not be enough evidence to say why this is clinically meaningful. Um, but the, the growth in the number of these codes is pretty astounding, I and mean, it's doubled just in the past year. Um, and that presents challenges, both for developing evidence for how we should utilize this testing, but also for just the claim systems. They're not updated that regularly to be able to have these new codes in them. And so when we're trying to get preauthorization or bill with them, 
things are going to be lagging behind. So while our intention is to have a clear, specific code for a test, we may not be able to realize that um, in the pre-auth process. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was policy challenges. So this is a paper that's a little bit older. It's from 2013. Uh, but this group uh, reviewed publicly available medical coverage policies for genetic tests from uh, 65 um, of the largest US payers at that time and found, not surprisingly, variation in both the number and scope of policies related to genetic services. Interestingly, half of the policies identified were specifically in place to exclude certain types of genetic testing. Um, I, I, I pulled out a few of the common themes that I thought were of interest. So now we often tell providers if you want to have a test, you should really try and articulate how that will change the patient's medical management. That's the most important thing. Um, at that time, only half of the policies, uh, policies even had that as a, an element within them. So I'm sure that's probably evolving, but um, is a logical reason for why you might want to do a test. And then the other point to pull out is for um, you know, genetic counseling. So it was either required or recommended, at least at that time, in many of the policies. Perhaps scary that only a few of them talk about the test being scientifically or clinically valid. Hopefully it just means it's implied, but, um, but I think when we're considering quality and identifying that that is important to include within coverage policies. OK, so hopefully you're not asleep or terrified, because now I just want to shift to um, interventions that we can do to try and partner with payers um, and support our patients in getting medically appropriate tests and not going bankrupt doing so. So this first case is an example um, from the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, um, where they have a genetic counseling team involved in the lab similar to ours. Um, they were finding that when they would receive orders, there was a lack of pre- and post-test counseling. Um, informed consent was often missing. There were new payer requirements that said that genetic counseling did have to come in order to get prior authorization before the test was ordered. Um, obviously, there were finding errors, um, duplicates as well. And um, the solution of trying to just refer to the genetics clinic was really not viable due to long wait times and the, and the access. And so when they looked at the data in 2016, about 60% of the orders they had received had no genetic counselor involvement. And so their solution was to launch this um, genetic testing clinic. And the idea of the clinic is it's staffed daily by a genetic counselor, and they're just on call real time to um, support patients and providers who are interested in co coordinating genetic testing. So a patient will be seen, say, by a neurologist who's interested in a test. And they'll talk about the test with the family and then refer the family over to the clinic. The genetic counselor can collect the family history, provide pre-test counseling, um, do the genetic test stewardship at that point to ensure it really is the appropriate test, um, obtain consent from the family and make sure they're really engaged in that, and then coordinate the logistics of testing and authorization. And then what's great about the clinic is the genetic counselors are also available um, to discuss results when those come back. So they basically sit in a room doing their other work and are just available um, when patients and families need them, which is a great service. Um, it's been very positively received by the providers there. And so Jody shared with me um, some of the information from the first year. They started it in January of 2018. Um, and most of the requests they received for patients seen in the clinic were from neurology. Um, and you'll see they saw 350 patients, but only half of those actually had a genetic test ordered. So interesting impact in terms of um, both counseling families, ensuring they were really engaged in that test. Um, and then also probably some of this is just, you know, the test was not authorized. But by having them involved, their insurance authorization rate was through the roof, which is pretty great. Um, they've done a nice job of aligning with their local payer, who is... Um, covers the majority of the patients they see, and by doing so can make sure the policies are reasonable and then um, be good stewards of aligning patients to those policies. So this is something I think would be pretty great to do at Seattle Children's someday. So the second example is from Seattle Children's, and so in our population, similarly, about um, half of our tests are ordered by genetics providers, but the other half are not. And so if you are evaluated um, and you have developmental delay and you happen to land in genetics clinic and genetic testing is recommended, you'll likely see a genetic counselor who will coordinate pre-authorization and um, provide pretty good patient and family education at that point. 
but if you land in another department, you may not have that same service. Um, and so as a result of that, um, patients you know, may end up getting bills that are unexpected. And they don't complain to the doctor, they complain to the lab. So this was our current state. Um, when we started our program, we were not looking at orders at the time of pre-op. We were just looking when the order was received. And so we wanted to get upstream of the problem. And so the first thing that we got to do, I'm, I'm actually glad that we don't have to do this anymore, although it's, it's journaling. So you get to draw out all your feelings about how terrible the process is as a first start, um, to articulate all the waste in the system. And um, I just am proud of that picture. And so what I will pull out from that is actually the best case scenario. So you can tell it's complicated. There's a lot of handoffs and frustration. Um, this is meant to be Swiss cheese of stuff not going through or being caught the way it should. But even in a best case scenario, this is what insurance authorization looks like. So again, it was a couple years ago, so fortunately genetic tests have come down in cost. But this was the test that we requested, had gotten authorization for. Insurance paid us generously $6,489. The hospital paid a portion of that for whatever the allowed charges were. And the patient paid their copay of $721. And so I point this out because, great, we got authorization, but authorization doesn't mean that it's fully covered. So in the process that we set up, we really still make, need to make sure patients understand what that outcome means and what it means for them financially and whether it makes sense to go forward with testing now or perhaps wait till they're later in their deductible period um, and really just have transparency in the process. So that was our problem and our solution was to try and create a process that was simple and transparent, that was standardized across the institution. So regardless of who recommended the test, um, they would get the same care and that we would ensure we were having the right person doing the right work. Um, previously, you know, sometimes it was the division chief of neurology doing his pre-auth work, which was just terrible to see. We want to take that off him so he can see patients and, and we can provide that support. And so our goal, or our approach, I should say, was um, to get institutional support and champions using that great drawing um, and to integrate lab stewardship case review um, with the process. So we didn't want to just push through a pre-auth without making sure it was really the optimal test or needed. And then um, make sure that we could identify any other details that were required upfront and provide it and make sure that um, the request would go through efficiently. So this is what the workflow looks like now. Um, the provider evaluates the patient in clinic. They may determine that a test is needed and then a communication order is placed in our electronic health record and then they're required to document medical necessity for the test. Um, and that's it, which is great. And no sample is collected at this point. That request then comes to our lab genetic counseling team. Um, there's a rotation of genetic counselors who review orders that come through. Um, and we are essentially, again, looking to see is it an appropriate test? Um, if so, has the provider selected a specific lab or do they want help? Um, sometimes it might be a very vague request, you know, I want a microcephaly gene panel, and at this point we can work with the provider to find the best panel option for that patient. Uh, we may suggest that they bolster their medical necessity language or add it at all, sometimes they forget. Um, and then our process would be to include all the appropriate elements to um, facilitate insurance authorization. So selecting the most appropriate CPT code um, based on our understanding of, of the coding rules and then providing um, whatever necessary forms might require, be required for this specific insurance plan. The information is then transferred to our insurance processing department, so we don't have to talk with the payer. We get to do our best work around really optimizing the test. And then we have a great team of um, staff who communicate directly with the insurance plan by fax and phone, and they're just really amazing people. But they um, communicate the information and get the outcome back, which goes to the care team. And if we get an authorization, the care team would then communicate to the family. This is, test was authorized. Um, you may have a copayer deductible. You should call your, your plan to get more details about exactly what that cost is. And let me know if you want to proceed with testing. And if they say they do, then the test is coordinated. So it's a much more streamlined process than it was before. Um, I do think, you know, based on our provider satisfaction surveys, that people are pretty pleased with the process and the support that's provided. And we feel be good because we're getting ahead of it from a stewardship perspective. 
Um, in the previous state, we would get an order and they say, well, it already pre it and the sample's already collected, just send it. And so this gives us an opportunity to um, try and optimize the orders a little bit earlier and in partnership with the provider. So the impact is um, significant. Um, by having the integrated pre um, process with case review, 7% um, of those requests are canceled with the permission of the provider, and they never clog up the system. So it is a lot of work for us to pass that through to the insurance processing department, then to the payer and back again. And so we feel good about removing waste from the system and doing our part. And then a good chunk of the time, 84% of the time, we're improving the request in some way. And again, the majority of that is related to improved necessity documentation. We're, we've done a lot of work to integrate payer requirements, so it feels a little bit like every month there's some new form or new process that we have to jump through, but because of the way we've set this up, we're able to um, protect our clinicians from that. They can do their best work, um, and then we are able to integrate that into our workflow and you know, prevent a lot of the back and forth um, with the payer for these requests. So an example would be um, Aetna now requires a specific form to be completed that documents um, pre-test counseling um, for an exome, and we can make sure that's completed up front before we send the request through to the payer directly, and it goes much more smoothly. Seems silly, but it really is a, a big win for those patients, um, prevents delays for them. We also look at requests that are denied. So we did some work um, with our genetic counseling assistant to um, help support providers when a request was denied, um, figure out the best way to appeal the request. And so um, by doing that, we, um, we could kind of categorize the reason for the denials. Um, and of the 70 requests that we, we looked at or captured, um, 11 of them we were able to have um, overturn and get an authorization for that test. And um, the reason for those denials was pretty enlightening. So it was simple things like the wrong policy was applied to the request that we had submitted, or you know, a piece of information that we thought we had, had been faxed honestly hadn't been faxed. It seems really silly, but, but details that um, uh, may not have been figured out by the ordering provider or taken the time to do um, that we could capture and ensure we get the authorization in place. Of interest, there were many of those that were denied for being experimental investigational. And those are really hard to overturn, and that was our experience. So we tried our best to write letters that we thought were compelling, um, but in the end, none of those were overturned, which is probably not a surprise to some, but um, was helpful for us to say, we tried, here's the many, many that we wrote, and then we went back to our insurance processing department and showed them the data, and they um, modified the workflow a little bit. So for patients with that specific type of insurance, they would just stop and say, you know, based on the, on the denial reason, we, it's not worth going through the appeal at this point, we can proceed. Your options are apply for financial assistance or um, proceed and this is what your out of pocket would be. And they would have that information much earlier in the process rather than us doing this futile um, uh, loop of trying to overturn the denial. So that was, that was really beneficial. Um, but frustrating when there aren't policies that cover tests we think are appropriate. So the other thing that we're working on is really advocating for appropriate coverage policies. And that's done both nationally, and I'll talk about that next, but also at a local level. So Washington is unique from our Medicaid perspective that we have a health technology committee that reviews um, different types of genetic tests or other services. Um, and there's an opportunity for us to weigh in on the coverage for those types of tests. So, a few years ago, they finally started covering chromosomal microarray, and we were able to provide feedback and I think have landed on a policy that is very reasonable for those patients. And um, just to plug, they're going to be looking at exome sequencing on November 22nd. It's a very interesting process if you um, have any interest in going um, to hear that or provide feedback. It actually seems very reasonable. Um, through the process of getting the microarray um, policy in place, we were able to build a relationship with um, the medical director at Washington Medicaid, and she is a lovely person who's really engaged in trying to make sure that the cover po coverage policies are appropriate for our patients, um, and that was a, a secondary benefit I don't think we knew would come along. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I do want to mention PLUGS. Mike did the honor of actually saying all the words, but I'll do it again. PLUGS stands for Patient-Centered Laboratory Utilization Guidance Services, and our mission is to improve test ordering, retrieval, interpretation, and reimbursement. 
and we currently it's a membership based organization um, run out of the Department of Laboratories at Seattle Children's um, and we have children's hospitals, adult institutions, reference labs and other companies that are all focused around this mission to improve test ordering, retrieval, interpretation and reimbursement. And the work of plugs is sort of fourfold. So we really started in this um, uh, area of providing tools for stewardship program development. So what we try and do with plugs is share our best practices with uh, members and then it's a great way to learn from members. So um, for example, Jody Vento and the work at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh is very inspiring to us to wanna see if there's ways we can adopt that into our own practice and she's great at helping us to do that. Um, the second initiative relates to case management. So for institutions who are not going to hire their own genetic counselor, or maybe just don't have the volume of requests that really need a full-time person, um, this is a remote genetic counseling um, service that can be involved to review test orders for appropriateness. Uh, laboratory, laboratory stewardship standards are important. The idea is to um, create a set of standards that demonstrate um, good laboratory stewardship principles, and if we can show that we're doing this great work, we can demonstrate that both to patients and to payers, um, that that should help us become in-network laboratory, laboratories um, and, and improve you know, reimbursement rates that way. And then the last initiative is our insurance alignment, um, and that's what I'll talk about at the end. So again, if we're going to do all this work to ensure the test is appropriate and show that we're good stewards, it would really be nice to make sure that um, the testing is reimbursed. So we do that in a couple, well, many ways, but I'm going to highlight two. So the first is medical policy development. So um, we knew exome sequencing was exciting, and a lot of people were not covering it. And so we created a coverage policy that we think is reasonable for exome sequencing and made it freely available on the PLUGS website. So payers can go. Um, we want them to steal the policy and implement it. Um, you can make edits to the policy. But the idea is that it's um, created by experts, is going to provide reasonable coverage, um, and, and we hope will be implemented broadly. And for exomes, it, it was. So, I know you often are surfing the Aetna website looking at their coverage <laughs> policy, but if you did and you pulled up our PLUGS policy and the Aetna policy, it's word for word their coverage criteria, which is awesome. So we feel pretty excited about that and we want that to continue happening. And so um, our most recent policy, just hot off the presses, is for rapid genome sequencing. Um, and so this will, you know, it's intended for genome sequencing in, in our um, critically ill neonate population and is more on the leading edge, I think. There's not a lot of coverage policies that exist, so we're really excited about the impact that this can have for patients. And so our goal, again, with PLUGS is to make this freely accessible, to disseminate through our relationships, both with labs and with payers, so that people will adopt it, and then ultimately patients are getting that better service. The other work I'm excited about relates to that grievance um, procedure, trying to get um, denials overturned for tests that we think are medically appropriate. So not stuff that we think you know, was a long shot or really wasn't, but things where um, either the coverage policy is outdated or perhaps the criteria just wasn't applied correctly. And that's actually pretty difficult to navigate. And so we have tools that are created for patients and families that help them understand just the language around insurance authorization and then how to navigate that process. So it's checklists and um, guidance on how to get what was the not, why did, was it denied and what are my rights for appealing that. Um, and so that's brand new and we're excited to see um, the impact that it can have and use it for our own patients as well at Seattle Children's. And then also just guidance for providers. You know, most of the providers grumble because again, we've made it really easy for them. They just have to put in this one order and hopefully write a note about why they want to test. Um, and so if they get a denial, um, navigating that appeal process can be frustrating. And so we're trying to create tools for them to be successful in that as well, which ultimately helps patients. Okay, so in the end, final stretch here, future challenges or opportunities, genetic counselors are eternal optimists. Um, I just wanted to give you sort of my predictions for what's coming, probably nothing surprising, but um, certainly I think the increase in patient-directed testing will challenge the framework for um, genetic test stewardship. 
um, I, I'm you know, eager to rise to that challenge, but we uh, conduct a provider satisfaction survey each year as part of our stewardship program at Seattle Children's. And this year asked a question specifically related to patient-directed testing. And 40% of the providers surveyed um, said that they had encountered patient-directed um, tests and had a desire for support in saying no to these. And this is one of the quotes. Uh, 23 and Me comes up often. I feel like this correlates with increased advertising. MTHFR is the repeat offender with these tests, and I'm thankful I have a hard stop with not offering that test here. We did obsolete that test, and on the test catalog it pops up and says there's no utility for this. We won't even collect it. You can't have it. And so the doctor can just point to that and say, sorry, I can't, I can't offer that to you here, which is really great. Thank you, Darcy, for that great work. Um, but 23andMe is difficult, so I think you know we have an opportunity to support our providers and then ultimately patients in understanding what are the tests that they're really seeking um, and, and how do they assess the quality of those. So the evolving genetic testing landscape is job security for genetic counselors, which I'm excited about. Um, but the accessibility of genetic testing will again continue to challenge our framework. Um, I think for if a family is, has done 23andMe or something, I, I don't mean to keep picking on that, but some, some of that direct-to-consumer testing, um, it's cheap, it's fast, it's easy, and then I want to talk to them about a clinical test that's meaningful and will impact their care but is more complicated and might cost them $500. How do I have that conversation and have them understand the value of that test and how it might impact their care? And so I think that you know, does sort of challenge um, or blurs the lines. You can check out this great article written in ClinLab News about blurred lines and direct-to-consumer testing. Um, innovation, so novel technologies are exciting. Um, figuring out how to assess those technologies and determine when they're ready for prime time um, will um, keep us all you know, thinking day to day. Uh, I'm grateful for the work at Seattle Children's where we can consider tests that we believe will be beneficial, but we're not really ready to start charging the insurance payer for it. And so we've set up a mechanism for being um, prescriptive about how we're going to use that technology and then gathering evidence for its impact and then really only starting to utilize it and bill insurance for it when we feel like it's really appropriate. And then through plugs, we can create a medical coverage policy that we think makes sense and disseminate that. And I think some of those um, uh, creative ways of dealing with novel technologies are really going to be needed. And then the last, quality. How do you really assess quality? It is really hard to figure out what we're, what we're pay paying for with the tests that are being offered in the market. At 14 new tests a day, I don't know how we can possibly keep on top of it. Um, and then the question of, is a bad test better than no test at all? I'm sure many of you have heard um, about um, sort of pharma-supported, no-charge testing um, at various labs, some of which are great, some of which may be not as great. And the question is, um, just because it fr it's free, is that really better than no test at all? Um, and I'd argue maybe no. Um, and so uh, I think, again, these are things that we'll all need to consider and um, will keep us, keep us engaged for the next many years. So I'll end with how can you be part of the solution? Um, so hopefully I've given you a framework for understanding the goals of laboratory test stewardship um, and recognizing your role in the genetic testing process. I know many of you are developing assays or running assays or involved with counseling patients around them or your patients yourself um, and so, or your families are patients. And so figuring out um, how to have shared language around um, test stewardship is important for the success of all of this. Um, hopefully I've described the role of genetic counselors and how we can partner through the genetic testing process and, um, and that payers aren't always the bad guys, that there's an opportunity to align um, and that oh, my, my wish if we could, if it happens, is for no more, uh, and it's genetic counselors too, to say, well, I don't know that you really need the test, but we'll just see if insurance will pay for it and if they don't, then we just won't do it. You don't do the test, it's really not needed, and ultimately you are going to pay. So that is my wish for you, and I just want to end by acknowledging all my colleagues, all who filled the audience with love, which is great, but truly, um, specifically Dr. Asti and Dr. Dickerson, um, Monica, for helping to make my role in the lab be come to fruition, um, and all my colleagues in the audience, um, the clinical genetic counselors at Seattle Children's, our stellar team in send outs and client services, the insurance processing department, Emily Prince is a gem who does all this pre-op work, and our operations team at Seattle Children's. 
Um, thank you, everyone. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to leave you with a couple of resources. Shameless plug for plugs, but there's great information there, including the policies. Share them with your payers if you happen to be talking with someone. And um, this book has some information around um, laboratory genetic counseling, too. So thank you very much. Yes. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, you know, we hang out a couple times a year. <laughs> see it. This, I understand this process for like rare tests for which testing is super expensive. Do you follow the same process though for some of the more common things like globin disorders or cystic fibrosis or something like that? We actually do. That's a great question. I'm going to repeat it. So the question was, I understand the process for expensive, rare genetic tests, but what about more common tests that may be less expensive? I think I've captured that right down. So, um, so our process is really to capture all, um, and part of that uh, is because there, there are insurance coverage policies that require pre-auth for those tests, even though they don't cost very much, so we want to be able to capture those. And, and cost is relative too, so you know, $300 may not seem like a lot, but if it's the family paying for it, we want to make sure that that is transparent. Yes? So uh, uh, on direct consumer testing, then I noticed that Ancestry DNA decided they'd get into the health business, and this um, more lab, and their model, as well as color genomics model, is one of you pay for the test and you get a for the genetic health service. And I'm wondering if you think that that has any role at all in healthcare to have someone subscribe to a, a service to have genetic health updates regularly. How do I even answer that? So the question to restate, let me make sure I've got it right, Brian, is um, for uh, services like Ancestry who are direct-to-consumer testing services that are now expanding into providing a more health service where you would get periodic updates on your health um, and are really subscribing to that seemingly full wraparound care. Um, so I think there are some services that are great no, I don't know about Ancestry Service, honestly. Um, there are services where um, you can enter your genetic information, say you've already had genetic testing, and track your variant over time um, and, and, and be able to learn new information about the interpretation of that variant. That, I think, is very helpful. Um, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with the other ones, but I do think it's going to challenge our, our way of providing health care because people are going to be coming in with reports from these other places, and this consultation service is going to be telling me I need to go to my doctor and tell them to do this one thing. Um, and then that puts doctors and then ultimately us down the line if they're doing testing in a hard place. So, um, you know, I think partnership is the way to go to understand what they're doing and be aware of it so that we know how to react appropriately. That is a great question and a very good thing to point out because we do, it's difficult to capture co the actual cost of doing the service versus the cost avoided and anything reimbursed and all that. So we definitely oversimplify it by, by stating, you know, the avoided cost for the test. Um, for us, our strategy and the strategy we try and say for others is um, to have um, a diverse portfolio, I guess. So, um, you know, our genetic counselor team, you know, we can justify much of our FTE by, by this work, but, um, but we also support our internal genetics lab um, and have other consulting work that we do that helps to offset salaries. Uh, when we look at other organizations within plugs and help them try and justify the service, typically for expensive tests, the cost avoidance is enough to justify it and then some. Um, the part that I think is less tangible is the work of all the people around it. So I mentioned and acknowledged, I should put them back up because they are so great, is all of the people lab, in the lab, in the insurance services department who do this work. And that is difficult to quantify. Um, but I do think that they're going to be doing work for stuff they didn't need to do. So getting rid of the work they didn't have to send out hopefully is offsetting some of those other processes. But maybe doing a deep dive into the cost, the true cost, is a good next step. 
All right, then I would like to thank uh, Jesse Connor for a great presentation. Thank everybody for coming today.